My guest today on The Wealth Manager is Karan Bhagat, founder and CEO at IFL Wealth Managers. Karan, long pending conversation, Thank but you. finally <laughs> we made it. And what a time it is for you guys, right? Uh, for someone who manages 1 lakh 20,000 crore rupees worth of AUMs, this must be a tough time. No, I think it's, uh, so just a small correction, so 1 lakh 50,000 crores. Okay. But, uh, uh, having said that, I think uh, from our perspective, it's a very disciplined asset allocation uh, framework. Mm. So, uh, you know, if you if you look at a period of 15 to 20 years, you at least had four or five times like this. Mm. And really from our perspective, keeping the volatility as low as possible is what is critical. And all our portfolios are geared towards keeping the volatility low. Mm. And uh, it's time like these when the volatility is lower than what the client would uh, be able to digest. Uh, it allows him to stick with his portfolio rather than take a rash decision and uh, get out. As a firm today, we would have nearly 55% of our assets in fixed income, 30 to 35% in equities, 5% in real estate, and 5% in alternates. Okay, so even on a year like this year, okay, mm. from year to date, equity would be around about a percent, two percent. Debt would be five to six percent. So obviously, you're not meeting your targeted return, but uh, you are at that four five percent mark. So, uh, you know, you don't lose your sleep and patience over your portfolio. So, no nervous calls just yet? No nervous calls. I think, uh, no, okay, let me not make it as simple as saying no nervous calls. I think uh, there is a possibility of a bit of a, uh, so the market's factoring a 5 to 10 percent probability of a possible contingent impact, okay. Mm. Uh, the fact is ILFS uh, uh, has shaken the market down. Uh, reality is it is 94,000 crores of debt. Nobody can wish that away. Uh, if at all you have to look at a positive, the positive is the 94,000 crores is fragmented. Okay, mm -hmm. so you've not got a single large institution which is kind of which exposed is to it that, all, yeah, upon itself. all upon itself. Yeah. So to to a certain extent, it reduces the impact of contagion. On the flip side, it puts into serious question the credibility okay, of that AAA rating. Okay, and it was AAA till around about four weeks back, and uh, if it's AAA and it becomes junk or derated in like three to four weeks. Obviously, then all institutions, wealth managers like us, and finally uh, clients start questioning the credibility of anything which is AAA. Absolutely. And once that happens, then really liquidity can dry out very quickly. And uh, it can dry out quickly because uh, clients, wealth managers, mutual funds start taking out instruments mm -hmm. which uh, may or may not be AAA, okay? may or may not be AA plus, but perceivably. Uh, you know, you kind of start discounting is it not being double A plus. And then, you know, it's it's like perception becomes reality, right? So if you go back in 2008 or 9, and you know, there's a small rumor for a day that ICICI Bank uh, uh, is going to go belly up. It was a rumor, that, right? Yeah. And then I remember in Ahmedabad, uh, there were some uh, 10,000 people who turned out on the ATM and the branch to withdraw their uh, balances from the bank. Now, it doesn't matter how good or bad the bank is, how robust the bank is. If everybody comes to withdraw money next day altogether, there's nobody who can uh, meet that obligation, right? So I think we run that 5-10% uh, probability risk of the contagion spreading, okay? Mm -hmm. I can't call it zero today, there is a 5-10% to probability. 85-90% uh, to probability some sanity will prevail. If some bit of liquidity comes back in the system, um, I think we will be in a situation not of default, okay? but a little bit of uh, uh, deterioration in profits, which I think everybody is fine with, okay? Mm -hmm. It's really the first one which causes a, a huge amount of uh, stress. Reality is, even if we come out of this incident over the next uh, week, two weeks, three weeks, mm -hmm. uh, borrowing costs are going to move up for sure, okay? okay? So impact on profitability will be there. Some of us will be able to pass part of it to clients. Some of us may not be able to part a lot of it to clients, but at the end of it, there will be a, uh, a kind of a reorganization. A down, yeah. yeah, there will be a reorganization on your liability side and on your asset side. So to a certain extent, profitability will take a hit, but uh, it's really not about that right now. It's really about saying that uh, it should not spread unevenly. Uh, you, you should not end up painting all the NBFCs in one brush. Mm. And uh, that's the risk you really want to kind of avoid. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, even if there is a 10% probability, uh, you want to ensure that your house is well guarded and when it says your house, I'm uh, talking about all our clients' uh, uh, portfolios with us. You got that uh, yeah, yeah, to ensure that um, it's kind of adequately protected, mm. even against that five to ten percent probability event. So how is it that you do that? 
no. in a time like this when there are so many domestic as well as global factors and you know they're all going to pay, play down like a pack of cards in the next one year how is it that you protect your clients back so it cannot be done like in one day okay yeah. so for example uh, if uh, for all our clients we prepare something called an investment portfolio statement mm -hmm. or what we call as an ips okay so the investment portfolio statement in a sense is a bible for the client's investments mm -hmm. It goes into deep amount of details as to how much in equity, how much in fixed income, how much in uh, real estate, how much in liquid investments. Uh, within that, in equity, how much in large cap, mid cap, small cap. Uh, how in fixed income, how much in triple A, <laughs> double A plus, and <laughs> quote, uh, <laughs> quote unquote, <laughs> double A plus and others, right? And within triple A, you obviously have two categories: triple A sovereign and triple A others, right? So triple A sovereign hopefully will not uh, ever come to that point, right? But hopefully. so you've got you've got that entire category there, right? Mm -hmm. And most of our clients would have double A and below as less than 15% of their fixed income portfolio. Mm -hmm. On the equity side, we would have nearly 70 to 80% in large cap mm -hmm. and 20 to 30% in mid cap. And so all of this basically reduces the uh, volatility. Now, if you want to do this overnight, it may not be uh, uh, possible. But typically on IPS, right? That's what IPS, you call yes. It? How do you tweak the IPS to try and mitigate the risk which you're question. suddenly seeing evolve in the market? So again, um, it's just, okay, so we, I'll kind of simplify it a bit. Yeah. But uh, let's take equities as an asset class, okay? So equities, if you see the large cap index, uh, broadly 16 to 19 times multiple on, on current forward year, next 12 month earnings is what the market has traded 80 to 85 percent of the time. Okay, So you track the market for the last 30 years, 80 to 85 percent of the time is traded in a range of 16 to 19 times. Above 19 times is traded nearly 10 percent of the time, below 16 times, 5 percent of the time. So as long as you're in the 16 to 19 times range, you know you are in the most probable scenario. Okay, If you're above 19 times, you know for sure sooner than later it's going to mean revert back to 16, 16 to, 19. to 19. If it's below 16, okay, you know for sure it's going to mean revert upwards back to 16 to 19. Now it's simpler said than done because uh, it starts at 19, it can go up to 27. If it stops, starts falling from 16, it can go down to 9. Okay, So you see the example of 2007, you had markets trading at 27 times and then within 8 months you had it trading at 9 times. Okay, Now obviously you can't get 27 right, you can't get 9, nine. right. It is all. It is always about saying my risk at this point of time is not justified for the amount of return I'm going to make. Okay, and that's really what something like this might tell you. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you go more and more north of 19, okay, as you're moving towards the 27 times, the risk you are taking is not justified by the return you're expected to make. So effectively, above 19 times, you knock off, let's say, your ideal ex equity exposure is 40%, uh, and you're currently at uh, 40. Okay and your minimum will be 20 at all points of time. Mm -hmm. So the 40 to 20 compression should happen every time the market's moving up from 19 to 27 times. Mm -hmm. So hypothetically, you knock off 2.5% every time. So currently, let's say the market's at 12,000, we're trading close to about 23 times, okay? So that 23 times, if it goes down to, let's say, around about 10,500 to 11,000, comes down to around about 19, 19 and a half times. So ideally, you resist from putting in large amounts of allocation above 19 times, okay, knock off a bit. It may be painful because you may get it wrong. The markets may keep heading up to 27 times, but you so know. you take chips off the table right away. Is right you, away. Is you you have to take it off, but and, and it's not a binary approach. You can't take off everything because oh, you yeah. might get it wrong. Similarly, south of 16, it becomes even more challenging because you know that the market, see, the markets will be falling for a reason, right? And at that point of time, to convince yourself uh, to put in money becomes tougher and tougher. But you know if it's south of 16, you know there's enough value. So as you go down and down from 16, you need to keep adding that 2.5, 2.5, 2.5%. And you know, construction of an IPS in that sense enables us and the client to derive the confidence uh, to be able to do that outside the, uh, or really outside what's happening in the market at that point in time. So in that, that, so similar examples then on the mid cap side, on the fixed income side, on GSEC and so on and so forth. So that approach is something which is uh, very, very critical. And um, it, you know, really as wealth managers, that's our first uh, obligation to the client. And you know, historically research has said 80 to 85% of the returns really come out of doing the asset allocation correct. Mm -hmm. And largely the IPS is a step in that direction where uh, we ensure that's the that penultimate that's goal. the penultimate yeah. goal. So the 80 to 85 percent of our job is really getting this IPS uh, right and in place. So if you had to construct an IPS of a hypothetical right. client right now, what would be the ideal asset allocation 
assuming that I'm looking at a little bit of a short term view. Okay, so obviously the more the shorter you make it, the larger the amount of volatility, right? So for example, equities in a year might be plus 20 to minus 35 percent. Over a three-year period, okay, the range becomes substantially tighter, of course. right? So for example, you tell me I want to invest for a year, possibly equity has to be zero then, okay? Because uh, really. If only for a year, you can't take a call, right? Because uh, on one side, you've got the ability to earn 20%, but you've also got the ability to lose 35%. So it really doesn't justify that. That risking risk, it. Risking yeah. it, right? If you spread it over three years, okay, your probability is to make 12 to 14%, lose 5%, okay? So that seems like a more reasonable risk so to you're take. you're definitely negating a repeat of 2017. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Uh, if For you the go, next three years also. No, I'm not saying that, I'm saying, I'm saying you have to have a structure, okay? So if it's one year, it's impossible to take a decision yeah. because you might as well then just come into fixed income and earn 9%, you know? Then why go for that extra four, five, six percent, you know? And run the risk, okay? Yeah. I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm not trying to do a trading call that the market is so good for one year or they don't look good, right? In three years, uh, it's a much more certain game I'm playing because mm -hmm. I'm more likely to make 12 to 15 percent and lose 5 percent. I push it to five years, okay, I'm more or less never going to lose capital and I'm always going to end up between the 12 to 15 percent uh, mm -hmm. range, okay. Mm -hmm. So effectively, obviously, my own risk, which I'm willing to take for the return I'm willing to make, becomes finitely in my favor uh, if I'm able to extend the period of time. So if somebody says I have money only for a year, I think my equity exposure will be zero. Mm. If somebody says I have money for three or five years, I'll push that up to 30, 40 percent. So, so for one year, if it's zero equity, is there gold? Because some of the top fund managers on D Street are also saying that you got to get your exposure a little up to even gold if you wish, because that's going to be a good hedge. Short term duration funds are also something that people are looking at. So we don't love short term duration funds and okay. credit funds because uh, we just don't like the fact that they are open-ended and they are taking a little bit of credit risk. Mm -hmm. um, we would prefer for short-term money to be in liquid funds mm -hmm. uh, or possibly arbitrage, but we really wouldn't push ourselves to take incremental credit risk to get an extra 25 to 30 basis points, okay? Because again, the risk return really kind of doesn't uh, pay off in a very, very large, meaningful way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay, so our philosophy from a wealth management perspective is really uh, a little boring, uh, but uh, we are more, we strongly believe we clients come to us for preserving wealth and not for creating wealth, okay, and that's a, a bit of a fine difference, but we believe clients come to us after they've created their wealth, and creation of wealth can only happen in the business activity they are doing. Yeah. Uh, obviously, there are exceptions, okay, so Mr. Junjunwala, Mr. Damani, Warren Buffet, Prem Vatsa, they are in the business of Creating, creating wealth. Okay. wealth so yeah. for them, that is their business. Okay, for our clients, they have created wealth out of their operating businesses, and you are managing uh, it. And we are managing it. So for us, really, clients come to us for two objectives, uh, or one large objective is to keep the purchasing power of their money constant. Okay, intact. Intact, and oh. that is really a fun gets broken up into two things. One is inflation, which broadly, let's say, six to eight percent, and second is the amount of money they are consuming out of the wealth they have created which would be typically in a year one to three percent, okay? Mm -hmm. So effectively, eight to 10 percent is the broad post-tax returns, which more or less all our clients are looking at, adjusted for all the volatility, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's what really defines our portfolio. So typically, we end up being 40 to 60 percent in fixed income, 30 to 45 percent in equities, and around about five percent in real estate. That's really the broader Large. construction. And then obviously, you need the IPS and the adjustment mechanics to kind of uh, so, so for the, the next one year, if it's zero percent equities, do you park all the money in a no, liquid no, okay. fund? No, no, okay. Let me make myself yeah, clear. Let's come if back. You're to coming that. to a hundred rupees today and saying I need this hundred rupees liquid after one year. Huh. Okay, then it's zero equities. Hmm. If you already got a portfolio of a uh, hundred rupees, which is invested forty percent in uh, equity, I'm not saying make it zero. Hmm. Okay. I'm saying if you get a new hundred rupees today and say I have this, I have to return this hundred rupees to somebody after. Uh, yeah. After year, then equity is zero for sure. Okay. Mm. Then you just can't do uh, uh, equities in any meaningful way. Mm. There is nobody in this country who can tell you with certainty that after one year you will be positive on equities. But I can tell you with certainty if you stay invested for three or five years, mm. your probability of making ten to fifteen percent is ninety percent, and your probability of losing money is less than five percent. Okay. That's that's the data point which is for real. <laughs>
typically tell me, you know, considering you're a wealth manager, this is a niche industry, lot of competition out there, and I would say that the industry is still very much at a nascent stage. It's only right. now that you're getting into that, okay, I can give my wealth to a wealth manager and let it be done professionally instead of my home CA or, a, or an uncle or an aunt who's good with math. Gone are those days. Uh, what are the challenges that you feel as a wealth manager you still face? Is, is there a behavioral pattern or a temperament change that you, that you need to work on when you meet your clients? Or, or are clients extremely savvy when they come to you and, no, and no, they know I, what to I expect? Think you, you get a mix of clients. Hmm. You get a, you'll have a lot of industrialists who've been managing their wealth professionally for the last 15, 20 years mm -hmm. because they've created wealth through pool of dividends which they've been paying out of their company. And they've been managing their dividend money distinct from their uh, business. Mm -hmm. They have second kind of clients like professionals and um, uh, especially in financial services and technology mm -hmm. where they've ended up creating a lot of wealth through uh, sale of stock options Esops, and so on yeah. and so forth. So there, obviously, it's a very different approach, but it's very structured, okay? Mm. So they let us a lot, spend a lot of time in exactly doing what I just discussed, yeah. setting the structure right, but then not getting very involved in day-to-day decision-making, okay? Yeah. So for them, the structure is more important than, whereas for the first set, which is the industrialist, they want to be also involved in the... Micromanage a bit. I don't want to call it micromanagement, <laughs> but, I want, but in the day-to-day decision-making, yeah. okay? Uh, because obviously, they're first-generation entrepreneurs, so they like it. They are involved with their own uh, uh, businesses and businesses so they're involved with well, their money. Yeah. Okay. Third, obviously, you have uh, individuals who kind of monetized their business. Okay, mm. so they've sold their operating business and ended up with large pools of uh, capital. Mm. So there, I think we are seeing a massive behavioral change. Okay, so if I go back five years, it was more an ad hoc approach. Mm. I'll choose three or four advisors and I'll kind of start. That I think has changed massively. I think uh, there, people are looking for a much more um, advanced way of managing money. Uh, they want to create a pool of capital for the future generation. Uh, they want to set a process and they do a lot of due diligence before they finally decide whom they want to uh, uh, deal with. And they're getting another client references where they've dealt with for three to five years. So it's, it's as good as, it's possibly even today longer than an investment banking pitch in terms of figuring out who's the wealth manager you want to kind of... Uh, yeah, uh, go, deal, for. go for. Yeah. So it's, a, it's, a, it's now a process. It's not one meeting or five minutes of uh, discussion, which chat, it possibly yeah. it was four or five years uh, back. Is it like a Pepsi Cola or FMCG war playing out when it comes to commission structure? I mean, is that not where really, you compete? Right? Not really. No, no longer. What it is it like now? It used to be seven, eight years back, uh, huh. to be honest. But now I don't think so. We're winning any mandate on uh, saying that we are charging you X fees versus charging you Y fees. To be honest, you know, uh, most of our clients, would we would not be ending up money. Our, our results are all public. Yeah. We're as good a public company. But 50 to 60 basis points is the maximum we end up earning from clients as commissions and fees, okay? And honestly, 50 basis points uh, versus the choice of getting the right advice uh, really doesn't de determine what, which manager you want, right? There's 50 basis points on a portfolio. Uh, there are so many times during the year you could take a right decision on, or a wrong decision or be guided rightly or wrongly mm. which can influence that 50 basis points in a very very large way yeah. so today i think as long as uh, you're true and you're able to establish a no conflict relationship with the client uh, i really don't see fees being the guiding uh, factor we recently launched a, a platform called ifl1 i was just going yeah. to come to that yeah. yeah so which is kind of integrated all of this without any oh. conflict of uh, uh, interest so an ifl1 client essentially comes and do everything in a direct plan. We'll be also the first people to launch all alternative investment funds and portfolio management schemes also in a direct plan, mm -hmm. pretty much like uh, uh, mutual funds. Yeah. So effectively, we are able to get all the products to our clients without a retrocession to us as an advisor. Mm -hmm. okay. Therefore, removing any kind of conflict of interest, even make the brokerage charges zero. Okay. So effectively, you, know, you have no churn uh, uh, motivation. You have no retrocession to receive from the manufacturer. So then the only thing you can uh, do is advise the client rightly. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll kind of sum off what you asked me by saying what, uh, what is the reason why. Differentiates yeah. you from So I think uh, it's a very slightly philosophical, but. Uh, Go for it. <laughs> uh, I think you need to kind of, uh, it might sound a little uh, cliched, okay, but um, you know, in any business there are three stakeholders really. So in, in one sense there's the promoter or the uh, owner of the business. Mm -hmm. Second is obviously the employees and the management team. And third is the client, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this is true for pretty much any business, okay. Mm -hmm. I think for the business to be rightfully successful over a period of time, uh, you need the minimum or the, uh, 
you need a friction free relationship between these three stakeholders okay it cannot be a, a zero friction relationship because they all three are running at uh, some kind of paradox with each other right the uh, employer or the promoter would want to pay the uh, management team the lowest management team and the business would want to charge the clients the, the highest the yeah. clients would want to pay the lowest fees to the uh, <laughs> so all three are running at paradox with each other right so in some ways getting all these three into a room and making it as friction free as possible but your business is a lot about a perception right you know i'm giving my money to ifl wealth but it's also about relationship i'm giving my money to karan bhagat mm -hmm. i like the team i like my rm in the bank or whoever right. i'm dealing with i mean tell me a little bit more about what are the challenges that you see because it's such a people's business it's a great question what happens yeah. when there's no karan bhagat do i like the next guy i mean it's <laughs> yeah. just a hypothetical example no, it's a great question so it's a great question so it's a great question so Uh, I am unfortunately now tied into this for a long period of time because I ended up being a promoter. But uh, 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 let's let's. I, I think perception is the most important thing oh. in our business, and uh, the way we've controlled perception is uh, we, we uh, in a sense, through the one obviously is the IPS. Okay, mm. tightly kind of ties down what the RM can do and what he can't do. And second, we very tightly control the product funnel, which is available for the relationship managers to take to our clients. We realize very quickly what is non-discretionary is actually kind of discretionary, okay? Because uh, though the client is deciding finally what to buy and what to sell, he is nine times out of ten, depending on guided. He is guided, okay? Mm. And he's saying IFL has asked me to do this, and therefore he is doing it, okay? And therefore it practically, in a sense, we need to even look at a non-discretionary or distribution business with a very large amount of fiduciary lens, as much as you would do on a discretionary business. and the only way to ensure that we are able to do that is ensure that we have a very tight product due diligence which finally goes to the client with the result today 8 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 ifl wealth portfolios will look very very similar the asset allocation might be different somebody might be 60% equity yeah, but the product else, yeah. the product final product, product is very very similar and our product team can then kind of manage those products very effectively and therefore we are able to maintain a broad brand equity rather than one client having a phenomenally poor experience and one client having a phenomenally great experience mm. and second uh, people have obviously our key raw material okay in that sense and uh, as much as we try okay the interaction between the client and the rm is 50% in his head okay uh, it's impossible <laughs> to kind of thanks for breaking the myth <laughs> <laughs> no no it's impossible to capture everything in a, a yeah. piece of paper on ips the client still going through a daily interaction with the rm so very important for us to retain our relationship managers uh but we very proud to say we possibly the only firm where uh, we've lost one senior banker in the last 10 years okay so more than least attrition yeah rate. it's least attrition rate so tell me what's a typical day in a life of wealth manager like how does your do day <laughs> begin and how does it end so it's it's, it's not as uh, fascinating as uh, one would like to believe <laughs> okay. uh it's still a fairly laborious uh, uh, job job because i think uh, indian clients still like to speak to the relationship managers very often uh they want to speak they want to meet uh so a typical day in the life of wealth manager would be doing at least 3 to 4 meetings and reaching out to uh, clients and possibly 15 20 calls wow. uh but uh, uh unlike most other uh, so we are a very american market we are not a very european market so clients like to be involved with their portfolios mm -hmm. so therefore the relationship managers will need to be involved and i am and you spend up spending an hour and a half two hours reviewing the portfolio and doing some research so that's that's really what would uh, a day would uh, end like unless you're talking about the last 5 days so <laughs> <laughs> sleepless nights not sleepless <laughs> nights but yeah you know long calls lots of them long calls <laughs> level of activity is higher and uh, obviously you need to be much more engaged with the yeah. uh, uh, with the client so we did an afl uh, tv event at 6:00 uh, which is a great uh, outreach to all our clients so essentially me and up and among all three of us were uh, there it's like pretty much like uh, a con like, call or uh, a press conference yeah but it's yeah. it's it's a live tv event like it is now yeah. uh, and uh, all our clients are logged on and simultaneously we we speak for half an hour but then there are what did you speak i'm very curious <laughs> <laughs> what was your message to the <laughs> pretty much to the world. what i've told you but uh, <laughs> we had half an hour of speak and then we had an hour of questions we got nearly a thousand questions we were able to kind of address most of them so we need to be engaged with the clients oh. and i think that's really what uh, uh, ultimately makes the difference you see honestly none of us can control the market right so once we did a great experiment uh, we we had thousand of our uh, not thousand that time we were 100 people we said you know can we really you know we saw we we had an illusionist who 
showed us how Dior to break the glass. Yeah, yeah, how to break the glass just by staring it. So we were all very inspired. We said 100 of us will sit in front of ET now, and uh, uh, we'll try and change the <laughs> uh, try and change, change the, the ticker. Uh, change the ticker. It didn't work, obviously. So then we decided let's not sit in front of the. Uh, it takes more than 100 ticker. to do that. It takes that. more than 100 to do that. We might as well go and spend more time with our uh, uh, clients. Clients. So pretty much last seven days is like that. Okay. Um, uh, we're seeing a little bit of ET now, but most of our time we're spending out with uh, the clients. With the clients. Okay, great speaking with you. Thanks, thanks, thanks so a lot. <laughs>